All right. Welcome to this episode of the Formula Podcast. I'm your host, Trevor Carlson. I interview and talk to people around the world about their habits, lifestyles, experiences, and perspectives to learn a little bit more about how they've designed their life to work for them and to kind of learn a little bit about what pieces I want to take and learn and add to my own life. Today, I have the privilege of sitting down with my friend, Andre Wright. Andre, we met years ago in the entrepreneurial program or on not in, but around the entrepreneurial program in Iowa City when you were doing, uh, I believe you were one of the organizers of Flyover Fashion Festival. Yeah, yep, Um, yep, one of the organizers, yep. You're a guy of many talents, uh, many experiences, but how how would you describe or what are you doing now? Like, what's going on? First, you know, hello to everybody, but then let me say I always describe myself first as uh, a husband, uh, father, uh, brother, a son, a cousin, a community member, and then and then I put an asterisk and I say, educator, artist, designer, business developer, entrepreneur, and those are my categories. Now I focus primarily around keeping kids that look like me out of cages and out of the hands of the police, and I do that in a very unique way with design. I teach kids graphic design, and I have a facility. Uh, called the Wright House. Uh, it's an educational facility uh, for creatives. Now, this isn't just for uh, kids that look like me. It's for all kids that want to learn art and uh, want to expand their skills. And so I got kids anywhere from 16 years old to 22 years old, some post-graduates. They might have graduated high school and they're in this ambiguous place where they want to try continuing education, but they just don't know how. And so I help those kids understand the importance of education. And, and, and so I guess you could say right now, my primary thing that I'm doing is educating and teaching people what I, I knew before. We got some pretty robust programs that we're offering um, as a part of our organization. It's a 501c3 nonprofit. So it's my way of giving back to the community. So uh, we're going to do this really cool thing uh, coming up here in March where we teach graphic design, fashion design, and branding and marketing in the evenings from 5.30 to 8 o'clock. And we're calling it night school and we making school cool again. So that's that's what we got going on uh, right now as far as our organization. But obviously I'm doing a lot of other things in the community to try to, try to make the quality of life better here for where I live. Nice. And that sounds like a lot. <laughs> You're doing a lot. Yeah, yeah. It's always a lot, man. When hasn't it not been a lot? When you, you know, that I wear a lot of different hats. Uh, all the time. And I'm grateful that I have the energy and, you know, I'm an able body to be able to do that, to do those things. So I'm just grateful that it's me. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think one thing I've noticed about you, like since I've, I've, I think I knew about you before I actually met you is you just you bring a lot of energy to pretty much everything you do. Like it doesn't seem like you're messing around with anything that doesn't make you really excited. Yeah, we only get one time on earth. So if we're going to spend the time, we might as well spend it enjoying it versus not. And I think that's my motto. Uh, That's why I've earned myself a lot of those opportunities because I put the things that I value most up front and I stand 10 toes down. I'm rooted in what I'm rooted in. And because of that, I got the relationships I have now, you know, so. Yeah, man. It's just, yeah, find your thing and stick to it and have fun at the same time. I think that's the lesson in that whole that's, conversation there. That's the key to life. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, man. It's so hard for many people to do that, too. Even with me, like, my basis for doing all this is art and creativity because that's where I come from. I come from a background of being an illustrator, being able to draw somebody while they're sitting there and hand them the paper and say, this is you. That's my background. So all my skill set, my problem solving abilities all come from a creative background. And I just stay in that vertical and I show uh, other kids how they they can unlock their superpowers as X-Men and use their skills. And that's what that's what we're doing. You know, we're just doing that. You know what I'm saying? Like we bring in something to, to our community that's never even been here before. So it's revolutionary, it's pioneering, it's trailblazing, all those uh words that you might say about the work that we doing so yeah if i could guess that you had like one other like key to living like a happy fulfilling life it's travel <laughs> so yeah how, how yeah many, how many countries you've been to now so i've been keeping a running list of 23 yeah 
23. I, and I'm not counting USA as a, a country because I actually live here. Right. Uh, but on any given year, I've lived in these other ca- countries, either a span of two days, one day, uh, two weeks, three weeks, sometimes even a month. Mm-hmm. And I've, I've afforded myself that luxury as well in, in starting to travel uh, just at 38 years old. So I've been doing this now for almost a decade. Nice. Uh, maybe, you know, so I'm a seasoned traveler. Mm-hmm. I, I like I even claim that title as traveler now. That's a thing. Just so y'all know, being a traveler and somebody telling you that you are a traveler is like a, a it's kind of like a, a, a special gift because everybody can't do that. And mm-hmm. we when you said when, when another person say you a traveler, that means something. Yeah, for sure. It's like a, it's like a badge. Yeah. What got you into because I think that was one of the main things we wanted to talk about is like. Like what got like travel specifically, but what is it that got you into travel in the first place? Because you waited until I feel like most people when they do like the whole backpacking thing, you know, they're like, I mean, if, maybe not American, but like the uh, like Europeans are like 18 to 22, 23. They're going backpacking, but you're 38 <laughs> and you're like, so what what was it that got you to do that? So I got a friend of mine who he used to travel all the time and I never understood it because I never had been anywhere. And and he had been to like, I think at the time he had been to like 130 something countries and I'm I'm blown away. I was just like 130 countries. That don't even sound right. I'm like, how? Hmm. Well, he's like, you book your ticket and you hop on the airplane and you go. And I'm like, you really can do that? Like you can just hop on the airplane and go. And I didn't even real, I didn't never realize that. And so I was intrigued by that. And I, I started to really, trans my family i came home and i started telling them all this stuff about this family friend of ours he's a family friend actually he's a godfather of my 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 daughter and i said hey man i want to go with you sometime and just like that he took me to the library i got my passport i filled out the information we submitted my thing i went to costco got my four passport pictures a month and a half or a few months later i get my passport in the mail and i said hey i'm ready to go and just like that a few weeks later I end up in Hong Kong in the middle of the night. <laughs> wow. And I think the district is called Wei Fai Long, where they party at, right? Like, uh, there's an area there that I'm talking about. It's the wildest party from so many people from all over the country ever. And I didn't sleep that night. We slept on a bench, a park bench, because we had so much energy. And I knew that the next day we was meeting my friend's friend for Dim Sun in the morning. And we had another flight where we was going to South Korea. So it was like, we didn't even sleep. I just got there and I was just like, whoa, this is crazy. Let's sit up on the benches. Uh, let's have a few brews and then let's tour around in a few areas. And then the next morning we had the dim sun and then we left. It wasn't like a really long time, but yeah, I've been to Hong Kong, man. I've, I've, I've been through that area. Yeah. So when you talk about travel, do you have any places that really stand out or make you feel like like they were... Was there a trip that you went on that you felt like changed your perspective in a way that maybe you look at travel or look at look at the world or even yourself? Yeah, there was one place in um, the first time I went to Cambodia. Uh, I in, we ended up in Phnom Penh, and we hadn't been to a bunch of museums and stuff like that. But the first museum that I actually went to was S twenty one, which was the torture school, which a high school basically from Paul Pot who was a, a dictator who lived during our time that basically committed a, a one of the more most horrific genocides of his own people during a, during the time that we lived and I had no idea that this even happened and so I was intrigued by all that information uh going to the school and learning about uh Paul Pot and the Khmer Rouge and what they had done and there was movies and stuff out and I was just I was ignorant and we went to the killing fields that day and and, and did a tour and wh- while we were walking through the tour me and my friend we had our water bottles with us but there was a kid who was in the field with his mother and his mother was picking like some green leafy plants but the kid was at the at the gate with his arms up, looking in the gate with his eyes, and his eyes was all teary, and he kept saying, food and water, food and water. And when I saw that, I most immediately get super emotional, having seen what happened to the, the population of people that were Cambodian, understanding that these was people with with a lot of melanin in their skin, and they was they was basically uh erased. 
from earth. I gave him my, my bottle of water and a, 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 a parcel of bread that I had just so he could have some food. And that just made me think like, man, how many more people we need to do that for? Not just here, but all over the world. And it kind of prompted my travels when I when I go to these places and I, I'm not staying in the, 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 the Ritz Hotel. I, I might stay there now, but when we was first traveling, we were staying in hostels and we were with the people in the community. And I was really understanding how big the world is and how big, uh, how much we're not, how much black people were not minorities, but we were also part of this world majority conversation and going on trips like that helped me realize that. So seeing him, uh, really affected me and it allowed me to understand travel from a, a, a sensitive and emotional standpoint and making that like one of the first things I think about when I travel is, is the people like what, you know, not just going there to extract resources, but how can I help the people that I'm there uh, supporting? I done, I done went to places that I done planted trees. Uh, I done planted trees in Shanghai. I done planted, I, I done went to, uh, what else have we done? We done done all kinds. Look, I've done all <laughs> kinds of, uh, handed people money on the streets. I done gave them my meals if they, they were hungry. You know, all whatever I could do from a philanthropic standpoint at that moment, I, w I was doing that, and that helped me realize how important it is just to help people. Yeah, it's it's interesting because it's um it kind of opens your eyes to like yeah you know, I think sometimes during our day to day lives I, I do this I'm probably very guilty of this where I'm like oh man I'm, something irritated me or frustrated me whatever I complain about it and you know maybe it, maybe it ruins my day maybe not maybe it just bothers me for a few hours but then when you when you kind of like go to these places and you see you see like some things that people have gone through and you know I have similar experience uh like when I went through Bosnia I stayed with the family that survived like the the siege of Sarajevo and like sat down with them mm. and they like told me mm. all this stuff and showed me things that you know you just can't forget and I actually I interviewed the guy that ran that uh he it was like a living museum is what they call it so they like brought people in you could stay in the home that they did no electricity no water you slept on the floor they wanted to show you what it was really like like that that war is is really like hell for the people that have to go through it and like i interviewed him and i was like asking him a bunch of questions and he was like you know like when when you're used to having nothing like having something is is like like you just appreciate it so much like every day you're not living in like this in like this hellish situation you just have so much gratitude and you're just so happy and thankful to be alive like i asked his dad who he was part of like the defense force there for the city and it wasn't he wasn't even in the military it was just like people in the city that didn't want the serbians to come in so he took us out to where he used to work and he was talking about the day that that he's like oh they love bill clinton there because the u.s under bill clinton like bombed the serbians in the hills and drove them away from sarajevo and yeah, was, like the day they left was like the happiest day of his life because his whole family survived. He was he started dancing and crying even when he's telling me about it because it was such yeah. like, an impactful moment. So when you even though you don't live those things yourself, it's like a piece of their experience rubs off on you and you take absolutely, that you. absolutely. And I've I've taken a little bit from every country from South Korea, from China, from Japan. Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, Malaysia, Iceland, Singapore, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Portugal, the Netherlands, UAE, Peru, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, the Philippines, Sri Lanka. All these places have allowed me to gain a little bit of their stories and then come back to the United States and then to be able to, to download those and, and tell them to people. From uh, the weather, uh, knowing that we work, they work in Celsius. Talk about meters versus inches. We get to talk about the difference in food and how they treat uh, the econ economy versus like how the United States treat the economy. And we talk about currency, the differences in currency, uh, and what the advantages of having U.S. currency and when to use uh, a dollar versus when to use a peso. So all those. Uh, shape that individual to become more of a renaissance person, more of a renaissance minded person and more of a worldly and global thinker, which only helps when it comes to any kind of thing that you're doing throughout your life, whether, whether it be like uh, you're at a, a meeting with somebody or you're just casually having dinner 
or if you have to do a deal. People want to know that you're well-traveled and well-versed, you know what I'm saying? And that, that for me, has been able for me to leverage a lot of relationships and a lot of conversations I could be in and talk to people because I've actually been to some of those places. Probably more than any anybody in my friend group. Ain't nobody, there's nobody in my friend group that's been to, and not only, so I've traveled to these countries, but multiple times. It's not just like I've been there once. I've been there like three, four, five times, six, seven, eight, nine yeah. times in various <laughs> cities in these countries. So it's not just going to the country. It's going there and like traveling through the country and going to various cities and understanding uh, that that yeah. North Vietnam is different from Saigon. You got to know the difference, right? And so just being able to have a worldly and global understanding, uh, all those experiences help make up who Andre Wright is and my family and the, our, right. our last name, our legacy that we leave. Yeah. So there was one thing, like when we were talking about doing this episode and releasing this during um, Black History Month in February, Respect. you discussed like the importance of, I think yeah. how you framed it earlier is people who look like you getting out and traveling more. Cause I, like I, I've done like the digital nomad traveling thing for a long time. And yeah, most people I see look like me though, like that are traveling from the U S. So I think make me think of like, I maybe know one or two other like black travelers that do like the digital nomad thing. It's just for some reason in the community, it doesn't seem like there's as many people that are traveling and maybe I have some ideas of why that might be, but maybe you can talk about like why you feel like it's important. And also, you know, we can just have the, have that conversation. I think most of the time, especially for us. And the reason why I'm saying people that look like me, just because I'm trying to broaden the conversation to others that might be of color. I'm specifically talking about black people in this when I'm, when I'm referring to this particular topic. When you look at passports and we look at people who actually have passports, black people have the lowest population, uh, have the lowest passport rate out of any other race. And I, I think that could be just that, uh, we don't have the financial or we think that we don't have the financial means to travel, right? Because you and I know that it's not as expensive as what people, if you've never done it before, you think that it's like a gazillion yeah. dollars and it's scary and all this stuff, right? But if you do it and you do it uh, frugally, you know you can survive. That U.S. dollar can help you survive longer than what you actually think. It goes a long way. And so us not understanding that helped. I probably would be in the same boat if I never met my friend who introduced it to me. So it was like, I got introduced to it and I got interested in it because that's something I wanted to do all my life. I always wanted to be somebody who could be in the air and travel and understand different countries and all that stuff. So I got introduced to it. So a lot of us ain't in those networks with people that would introduce that concept to us either. I think those are more people that are in more professional roles or have infrastructure in their home and families typically have the luxury to do travel like that or have been taught how to travel or understand the importance of it. And and, and that's why you see other demographics travel more than black people do. Because I wouldn't just say Americans travel a lot. I mean, the Aust Australians, they travel a lot. The Chinese, they travel a lot. I mean, you see other cultures when you travel, you, you can recognize the different types of cultures that actually do travel. And it's not mostly Americans. Like, if we want to just even be honest about that, the most of the digital nomads or the people that's just doing their thing, they're not Americans either, right? You know that, Trevor. You know, it's very few Americans you're going to run across that can do a sabbatical due to capitalism. They got to come back and pay for all their stu they stuff. So <laughs> I always shout you out because it's very impressive that you've been able to do this and, and do it for a number of years. And so the other thing I want to say is that our culture don't understand the importance. So uh, to travel to Sri Lanka, why would they go to Sri Lanka? Because they got good food, Why would man. they go to... Yeah, yeah, if we, yeah. See, good food, but then also, I just told you about the Ceylon tea. Yeah. There's so many other things that uh, that are, are are enriched by you going there, and just the education. And I feel like if our culture knew that there was going to be an incentive and benefit to be able to do that, there would be more travelers. Even though we do say we want to go to beaches and do all that stuff, we do want to do that. I, don't get me wrong. Our culture wants to be a part of the, that culture. We just never been introduced to it in a way. So for me, uh, my influence is I'm showing you how you can do it. And I'm talking about it in abundance and I'm having fun doing it so I can influence you to, to for you to take your next trip. 
and for you to fly to somewhere that's foreign that nobody's ever heard of and introduce us to it. So that's kind of how I've been using my travel, uh, especially like on my Instagram page. If you go to my Instagram page, you could kind of see the different things that I've done in those areas. And I hope people are being inspired and want to uh, go make their own travel plans and go, go to places that I've never even been mm. before. And so that's kind of how I've been using my influence. Also, as just being a black man and traveling late in my life, you know, I'm not going to wait till I'm 65, 70 years old when I can't barely walk to the place to go travel uh, right now is the best time for me to make that move and go see stuff. And uh, I'm still agile, able body. I can still do a lot of different things. And that's why it's important for me to talk about that now. Yeah, for sure. And I, and I think that it's also like, like for one of the things is I think being from Iowa in the Midwest, you're, you're not very exposed to a lot of this stuff. Like, I don't think, I don't think I even really knew the only people I met that were doing a similar thing to what I was doing were people that I saw like online and that I like reached out to and talked to and was like, yo, how do you do this? This seems really cool. <laughs> and and then because it's if you don't have exposure to it, it's really hard to think it's even possible. So that makes a lot of sense that like folks in I mean, whether it's different parts of the US, different cultures in the US, if you don't have exposure to something, there's just like are you going to be the first one that just like sells all your shit, packs your bag and just like goes to Sri Lanka? Pro I mean, you got to have a lot of. Yeah, I mean, not. Of balls yeah that's, a, that's a hard. I mean, how you going to do that? If you ain't had no, ex no exposure to anything. You're going to be scared fighting out your life, you know? So for me, it was my friend. And because he had been to all those countries, he knew that it was easy just to jump on the airplane. So his explanation to me is like, yo, you just get on the airplane and let's go. And it was just that easy for mm -hmm. me. But I I was exposed to that. And if I never had gotten exposed, if I would have never met him and he was from somewhere else, he wasn't even from Iowa. If I would have never met him, I probably would have never, we, we probably couldn't have this conversation or any kind of dialogue around travel because I wouldn't right. have been anywhere. Just yeah. Mexico. So if there's somebody who hasn't had exposure to this and they're thinking of you know getting started, what what would you tell them? Like if they're like, yo, Andre, I I would love to travel and try some of these things, but you know, I just don't know. Like maybe they're scared. Who knows what it is? But they they like have that innate feeling that's pulling them towards doing it, but they haven't made the leap. What would you tell them? You know, what I would do is first is do the research, right? I think that's before you do anything. You do some research and get a travel plan. Maybe you could find some friends that have some like-minded uh, ideas like you and that want to do some stuff like that. I think that's always fun to travel with other people. Since I've been traveling with other people, I've now traveled alone. I can travel by myself. But when I first started, I was it was with other people. And then, I, I know this might sound crazy, but there's those groups you can join. Like those uh, travel groups just to kind of like get a precursor for just being able to get in the air and be a part of a tour and just kind of, it might be worthwhile to join a group just so you can like get your, get your beak wet a little bit. And then after that, you can take your own trip, but at least understand the idea around traveling because it's not easy as much as we have traveled, it's, it's really not easy from a logistical standpoint because you go into places that don't speak the same language as you. They, they don't talk, you know, they don't move like you do. It's all different. And so especially if you're going somewhere far east, southeast Asia or something like that, it's going to be very difficult for you to navigate. So, yeah, that's, that's some few things that I would tell them for starting out. And have a lot of courage and have a lot of fun and try new stuff. At one point, I jumped. I wasn't able to jump in the Pacific Ocean because I'm not that good of a swimmer. But this last trip I took, we were in the Philippines. No, we were in Thailand. We were in Thailand. And I was able to jump in. Nice. <laughs> I mean, come on, man. This is like this, It was a yeah. big deal for me to, to jump in the water and like off a That's boat. That's sick. And, and I was the second one to do that. And I was, I was pretty proud of myself, man. And that all, the all, Meek overcame that fear through travel. Yeah, dude, it's through it's, travel. Uh, it's funny, like as you're traveling around, you you, I think a lot of people think like, yo, if I just go travel or if I go do this or I go do that, like everything will be great. But I think what happens is, whatever fears or all that shit that you have at home, you might forget about it for the first week. But at some point, you still have that shit to deal with. So, yep, you do. You still do. So. But while you while you traveling, just enjoy it, every yeah. second of it, because for the most part, um, even though I've been to some places multiple times, 
every time I've been there, I always thought like, I probably won't ever come mm -hmm. back here again. So sometimes through your routes, like to get to a certain destination, you might go back to Cambodia and to Phnom Penh mm -hmm. for a couple nights just to have a layover to get to the, you know what I mean? So it's been situations like that. And like I said, I've been to a, like, think about it, Japan four, I've been to Japan four times, to Dorita, to Tokyo. I've been to Phnom Penh four times. I've been to Vietnam twice. I've been to, let me, let me think of the Philippines from Manila to Makati. I've been to, uh, multiple times. So you know what I'm saying? Like it's once you go there, you just don't know if you're going to go back. But once you do go back, it's like, dang, I'm back yeah. here again. And you know, it's the, the experience is still yeah, the same. It's kind of like when you realize it's like the only time you might do something, you might value it a lot more. I'm a little yeah. envious of like myself when I was traveling early on. Cause when I was doing all this stuff, I was just like, Whoa, everything was just like, Holy cow, this is so crazy. And I think as yeah. I kept traveling and I realized like, you know, if I ever really want to go back somewhere, I can definitely like, it's, it's not that hard. You, just, yeah. you can just go, so right? Think, You've normalized, you normalized yeah. it. it. It's normal for you. Now it's not as mm. exciting. Let me ask you, Trevor, how many places have you traveled to since you've been traveling? <laughs> Have you keep an, do you keep a running tally? Uh, so I'm pretty sure I just make up a number every time someone asks. Because I'm just like, I know it roughly it's it's like over 30, but less than 60. That's like my range. I don't know exactly the number, but because it's like yeah. almost every country in Europe, lots of Southeast Asia, some in the Middle East, uh, two countries in Africa, Mexico, Peru. I don't know, all over. <laughs> just a, a lot of places. So impressive, man. That's so impressive, man. That's why I say you like my best guy. When I talk to my guys about they travel, I'm like, no, I got a guy too, Trevor. He's done been to some places too. I got people too, man. Don't think you the only person that got travel friends. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like, I think, <laughs> you I know, think I just... I do stuff a bit differently too because I think when I, oh you were talking about pri uh, like how much it costs earlier right and I think when people look at how much yeah. it costs to travel they're like yo I'm gonna go to Paris I'm gonna stay in like this fancy area I'm gonna go to I'm gonna go to London I'm gonna go wherever and I've been to those places and let me tell you they are way more expensive and way more disappointing than if you go to like like I love Albania because it's cheap like I should well it's I shouldn't say cheap but it's like the, the, what you Affordable. get for your dollar is a lot and you can have you get the yes, value. you can have a really good time on a very limited budget and you get to experience all these things nature good food great hotel or airbnb or whatever you want just a very unique experience without a lot of the headaches of going to a heavy heavy touristy area where in paris you might get like half an Airbnb for the cost you can get a four or five star hotel in some of these other places. So right. it's, it, I don't think it's that expensive once you know what to do, but I think a lot of people get caught up in the, like what everyone else is doing, like the social perception almost. The yes, romanticism about just going to Paris and seeing the Eiffel Tower and staying in a place close to Paris to look out the window. Cause my family <laughs> did the same thing until I told them, yeah, we're not going to pay $600 a night for a hotel room. That's probably not yeah. going to happen. And in fact, it's five of us. So we got to pay for two. Cause you know, the rules there, you can't just squeeze five people in a room. They're not going to have that. You got to pay yep. for both rooms. So I wasn't doing $1,200 a night. And we go, it's going to be there for two days. That's $2,400. You start doing the math. You're like, nah, we're going to stay down the street. <laughs> like, it probably one of these, uh, what's what's one of them hotels over there? Uh, the Utica oh, yeah. or something like that. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know exactly. what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah. And, and so one other thing I was going to say about one special place that I've been, and I, I showed up there three days after the Easter bombings was in Sri Lanka. So there was the bombings there and a lot of people got injured and I think some perished. And when we show up, it was on high alert. That's the first time I've ever been to a country on high alert. I think this was in 2018 and we were going to cancel our tickets because I'm scared. I'm like, man, I'm not showing up there, man, with the bomb, man. They, they still going to be bombing and stuff. But that was the best time to show up there due to value because there weren't any Americans. It was only uh, people from Sri Lanka for the most part. And the dollar, man, they stretched. They wanted that American dollar so bad because you think they were thinking that the tourism was going to stop because of all the, the danger people were saying it was. And so we had a ball. I'm saying like it was freaking amazing. And the dollar stretched so long. Like I would call my wife and say, look at where I'm staying at. And it would be like next to this. I mean, the mountains like right there. And I, I got my feet up, and it's, it was just phenomenal. The whole trip was phenomenal. Yeah. 
And one other thing I, I want to mention is before before recently, because uh, I like Thailand. I like I like going to Thailand. I like the food there. I like the heat. I like the environment. I like the beaches and stuff like that. Sri Lanka was like one of my favorite places to travel. Was one of my favorite trips, and I've met a lot of people from there. And I've even done some some organizing with activists uh, on the ground when they had the u- uprising. Because I got a friend, one of my comrades who lives in Minneapolis, who actually is, is Sri Lankan, and her family still lived there on a farm. And so when she went, she was back home during the uprisings to, to help with her family and her mother. But she was organizing mutual aid to other people. And when I was on the train from Candy to Ella, which is a nine hour train, it's the original train that the British used to steal all the the spices and everything from the Sri Lankans. I met a girl on this train, Maza. And Maza is amazing. She was going to school to be a doctor. And she became a friend of my family's because I introduced her to my wife and my kids and all that good stuff. And because I knew because I knew Maza, I was able to connect her with my friend uh, Sharanthi when she was there and they were able to organize on the ground during the uprisings when they was trying to overthrow their king. And so that's what relationships, that's a global relationship from Minnesota all the way to Sri Lanka. That's a far connection. And she, I just happened to know her because I had been to Sri Lanka. And I know we were talking about value before, so I spin off and start talking about that. But the value of just being in that town, I forget I forget how many Rupin B it was to the dollar. It was a lot. Mm. Man, we were we I mean, it was a big yeah. thing, man. It was a big. It was it was like for every dollar it felt like it was like a thousand almost. That that's how it that's felt. Crazy. So um you could only imagine. You could only imagine it was the best time uh we had had during our travels from a, a value standpoint, like how we could exercise our dollars. So that's wild. It's like it's like a very it's kind of a controversial thing where it's it's like when something happens, should you it go is. somewhere? And I think like there's so like in Ecuador, I'm supposed to get Ecuador in June and I did, I'm supposed to do like a video project there. And, um, but there's been a lot of violence there recently. So all these people have been canceling their trips with this company I'm supposed to go with. So they're like, I don't know, there's a lot of things that are going on. So they're, they're like offering discounts for people to keep, continue to go and all this. And like, if you look at how, like, is it unsafe to the average person in Ecuador right now? I don't think so. Like, from what I can tell, it seems like it's, there hasn't been anybody, I don't think there's been any, like, civilians hurt, but the outside perception is it's like, I might be very wrong on that too. There might have been, and I'm just haven't done my homework, so hopefully nobody fact checks me on that. Well, you, you, you find out from the people in the yeah. community, you, you know, you, you find people on the ground, people that travel know people that know people, and you find out and you mm. make friends. Because the media will hype it up and make it so you can, you us Westerners don't go nowhere and spend all our money in America. Yeah. That's the that's the plan, right? Like let's keep capitalism capitalism and let's not allow them to experience anything from the east or from the south. No yeah. way, we're not doing that. Or the north, they got to do everything in America. So your op, the the opportunity for to be able to go there and actually capitalize off of it. It's, it, yeah, it's taking a risk, but if you do take the risk, you're probably going to win on that risk because you just can't listen to the mm. media. And then you find people that are on the ground that tell you the truth about what's actually happening and what's actually going on. Yeah, that's true. It's like I, I was in, um, I was in one, I've been in so many countries where there's been like riots and unrest, like while I was there. And I didn't even, I didn't even know because <laughs> I was like, it was yeah. one, yeah. one, uh, actually when I was in Albania and Toronto, they canceled the elections and I was, and in the capital, less than two or three miles from where I was at, there was a huge protest and a couple protesters got shot by the police. I mean, it's really sad and it sucks and it's, it was a bad situation. I didn't even know. Like somebody else told me, yeah. somebody else that wasn't in the country told me, they're like, oh my God, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm just drinking. Yeah, because if you're not, you're, if you're not involved, if you're not involved in the yah, yah, rah, rah, then it's probably, chances are you're not going to be affected by it. But if you're going over there for that, then you're probably going to be in the middle of some of that rah, rah, yah, yah, just because you're going over yeah. there for that. But typically if you're not involved in it and you're not trying to be around it, and you're not promoting that, and you're just going there actually as a tourist just to experience the community. They want your money over there. What you think? They actually want you alive. They want you spending, go to their shops. You know, like they got a plan for you when you yeah. get there. Yeah, it's I don't know. It's just such a it's like the perception versus reality, right? It's like 
if you live in like some, let's say there's like violence in Chicago, but you live in Illinois on a farm and someone's like, oh my God, you live in Illinois. Are you okay? It's like, yeah, dude, I'm just got my cows. Yeah. Here. It's like, man, what do you mean? That's like four hours <laughs> it's away, like, bro. It's like, yeah, I'm just chilling. <laughs> Watching TV. Yes, no problem. I, I wish them well, but I didn't. I'm not worried to right. hear that. Yeah. Um, okay. So I know we're kind of running running out of time a bit. So I just wanted to ask you a couple more questions. Just yeah. like, so cool. if you were to think of maybe one or two off the beaten path places where let's let's say this person that asked you about travel, they've decided to go, and they're like, "All right, I want to go somewhere special." Where do you tell them to go? What do you tell them to do? Damn, that's a good question. Uh, I might tell them to do a few different things. I might tell them to go to Hong Kong and then go to the peak and manifest their dreams at the top of the peak, which is a, a mountain that you have to take a train that goes like this. It, it's like a, a very vertical train that you, you go. No, have but you you're stressing that? me out. I don't like I don't like this. The like. Oh, it's wonderful because once you get to the top, you get to see the whole city of Hong Kong. Then I might tell them to go to maybe the Wiz Khalifa and UAE. Oh yeah, yeah. And make a wish at the top of the the highest building in the world, something like that. I might tell them to go to Corone or a beach somewhere in the Philippines and maybe go sit in some hot spring and see how that feel and being in another country, relaxing country. I might tell them to go to Japan and experience the sophistication of the people and understand their cleanliness of their their downtown of Tokyo and and just and wonder why they even want to go back to America and experience the jungle that we live in and all the mess that we have to deal with because these people are so orderly. I might tell them stuff like that. You know, different experiences that I've had then I've been able to come back and, and, and uh, do. I might tell them stuff like that, yeah. Trevor. One question. Do you plan your travel out or do you kind of like let it happen as you go? Mm. Both. Both. So it's been like on this last trip, we planned to go to the UAE, which was planned. And we planned to go to Thailand and we planned to go to Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyzstan and all those places. But in the midst of uh, going to some of those places, like we were in Thailand, we got bored with sitting in Bangkok. So when we so we, we took a flight down to Krabi and we stayed in Krabi for the last, next three days. And that wasn't planned out. It was just something mm -hmm. we did. So, yeah, there's always this opportunity to plan a trip inside a trip once you're over in that area. Because the trips, obviously, when you're overseas is a lot cheaper. Yeah. But but we, we go in with an itinerary, though, like some kind of knowledge of what we're doing. We're not just flying over there to one place and say, oh, uh, look, look, man, where should we stay, <laughs> man? Should we, uh, you know, no, yeah. no, we got it. We got it pretty mapped out in. And, and it's kind of funny how we run it uh because we we, we kind of use like military rank and so we got the general kind of he has the most experience he he knows more about everything than everybody and he's kind of the one who's kind of like setting out the the the, the layout and he's incorporating his his first colonel or his his lieutenant which is typically me because i probably have the second experience he's 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 quality checking making sure that the trip is like of par and then we got the cadet and, and people that we typically bring with us that's never traveled before or maybe been on one or two trips in their whole entire life. So we get to pick on those guys for a little bit. And then they usually bring some or somebody to bring or, or student or somebody like that. So we got a base. It's like basically like the military, man. Yeah. And we got other friends that are in other countries and they lieutenants or they first colonels too. There's some been uh, uh, promoted and some that have been demoted. <laughs> Yeah. yeah I... <laughs> so it's fun, man. It's a fun life game. Uh, it's like Monopoly in real life, I guess, if that's what you want to say. It's like uh, world, world yeah. Monopoly. Yeah, this cracks me up because I feel like the way that I do this a lot of the time would stress you out where I'm like, I'm like at the airport before my flight leaves and I'm like trying to figure out where I'm going to stay when I get, get to this place that's 20 hours away. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, you yeah, know. So you you use a lot of booking.com? Yeah, Airbnb, booking. Um, sometimes I'll reach out and yeah. see if I can just book directly with them because that's a money-saving tip. Like yep. if you can book directly with them off the platform, yep. then they save money too. Or you just book like one night and then they let you extend for cheaper rate once you get there. Let, let me ask you a question. Do you plan on uh, coming out with a travel guide or some kind of publishing some kind of book on like the right way to travel or some kind of like like workshop or maybe some live video of yeah. you or 
or are you going to be the next uh what's that guy who uh says wow after everything he eats mark <laughs> oh no uh no. mark weens let me mark let me send you something so i have a full travel channel that i'm just still publishing like my india videos now i think i'm up to i'm just under 7000 followers on it so it's slowly getting there one day at a time um okay so you got something you working on you could yeah I'm, I'm this is this is the what's what's that uh, you made me think of that cliff it's like let him cook <laughs> it's like this is <laughs> i think this is the year that that it's going to take off because i've been starting to get some like paid paid collabs and paid trips and stuff like that so like the peru trip was 100 percent paid for i got altitude sickness from, from hell man i was supposed to be recording you need to the cocoa everything leaves? man i had cocoa leaves i had i had the medicine that you take for it yeah i was gonna say did you get did they give you the? Bro, i had everything and i i got like i got like asthmatic symptoms at that height at because we were at like we were we didn't go below 50 no not fifteen thousand. What was it? We didn't go below. Well, it's eleven thousand. The elevation is what eleven thousand. Eleven thousand is it? That's in the Cusco, but we went all the way up to. We did this high altitude trek for five days, and it was like we were. We hit. I want to. Was it fifteen thousand or seventeen thousand? Was the highest we hit feet? Yeah. Wow. And it was. I just got wrecked, dude. I'm. I had to ride the horse ambulance, and yeah, <laughs> get out of here for real. You were that guy, I, man. Like. And so, how, how long did the it whole last? time? I did the whole thing with altitude sickness. I hiked, and I and I did they when I got to the end. The uh, the guides were like uh, in Spanish. They were saying that we've never seen anyone get as sick as you, and not like demand to go home. They're like, we actually have a lot of respect for you. You're a really tough person because of how messed up you were. And I was like, I don't know if that's a good. Dang man, you was like that man. I heard stories. I've heard stories. Yeah. But but I, and I took my family. It was me and my kids yeah. who went. Like I took my wife didn't even go. It was just me and the three kids. I and mean, man, it was funny. I, I got a story about the cocoa leaf. We you know you supposed to chew it and spit yeah. it out, right? Like get rid of it right away or whatever. We had that shit in our mouths for like hours, bro. I'm talking about all the way till we got to the hotel. And my friend looked at us like, y'all still got you guys are gonna die. You still have the cocoa leaves in your mouth? Be like, yeah. You guys are gonna die from that. You know, it was just it, it was just a joke. And my daughter, she opens her mouth, she got a whole bunch of leaves in her mouth because she didn't want to get sick. And she's only like five years old at the time. It was just the most cutest oh and the funniest God. thing. Dude, that stuff that stuff is potent, man. You gotta be careful. It's strong, <laughs> dude. It's strong. It's real cocaine leaves, man. It's real. <laughs> yeah, it's oh my God. Yeah, we could talk just probably another hour about peru oh yeah just about the oh peru god yeah that was it was wild i'll send you the video i did for the for the company it's on their channel now but i would love i would love to see it you're gonna see you can see me in my oh i i i'm putting another one up on my channel where it has uh it has me on oxygen it has me like swearing up a storm because i'm just like this is the fucking hardest thing i've ever done in my entire life <laughs> and i'm like i just wow. look wrecked and somehow I still shot the video that we ended up with. I don't, I think it was a complete miracle that the video even got made, but it was, it was a wild ride, man. Yeah, I, I can only imagine, man. Like I heard the horror stories and I, I got a little sickness when I was over there too, like mm. from food, but not an Altenew sick. Well, I had to take the Pepto-Bismol, I had to drink a, a glass of hot mint water to try to cool my stomach down. I had ate some street food and messed my stomach up. So I know what you mean, man. I was yeah, sick as a dog. Yeah, be careful with that, man. I've, I've had that happen. Yeah, you do, man. <laughs> I, I learned my lesson. I don't really do that as much anymore. I might every now and then dab, dabble, but I would have to be very intoxicated for me mm. to do that. But for the most part, I'm going to like more quality. I'm older now. Like I did, I did all that stuff back when we were first traveling. Now I go to quality restaurants. I try to stay in the best hotels, whatever I can do just to not be a part of that type of yeah, life, you know. When I'm not with my fiance, I'm I'm staying in I'm stay I'm going like in the dirty places <laughs> like checking things out. Yeah, well yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You you you're not gonna do the Taj Mahal yeah. by yourself. But yeah, you're staying in the hostels, the little uh what do they call them, the pill. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. sleep rooms yeah just just one room one bunk bed you don't need a mm -hmm. whole lot you know us guys we don't need right. a whole lot that's true all right one last question just any piece of advice for anyone really looking to like to get out there and travel any anything you would tell them as they're as they're packing their bags to hit the door first of all let's make sure you got a passport <laughs> 
that's the big thing. Get your passport. It takes a little time. Get your passport. Set your plan up. Don't be like Trevor and try to figure out what the hotel is when you get there. Actually know a little bit before you get there. So do some yeah. research. And more importantly, the biggest thing is enjoy the experience because it's something that will last you a lifetime. And the value of experience is worth more than anything you'll ever purchase in your life. Because when you sit in on your deathbed, if we all get the benefit and to do that, you'll have those memories that will play over and over in your head of things that you've experienced. And you can't do that with no car, no house, no whatever, you know. And so that's why it's so important to travel. So if you can do it, go out there and do it and do it to the, the best of your ability and always to make sure you're having fun while you're doing it too. That's great, man. I'm going to end this off there. 